Uh, this morning we're returning to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've just gone through the, the Beatitudes, and now we're going to be looking at uh, the next section, which is in verses 13 through 16. This morning we're going to be focusing just on verse 13, but I'm, I'll read those uh, four verses as we begin. Again, Jesus addressing his disciples primarily, uh, but also those who had gathered around to listen to him says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning and to our growth in, in the likeness of Jesus. Now, I've already mentioned that we've just finished looking at uh, the Beatitudes, uh, those several pronouncements or declarations that Jesus made of the blessedness that belongs to us. Again, remember, beatitude means the, the blessing. These are the blessings. The blessings of inheriting the kingdom along with all of its blessings, the blessings of, of comforts. And again, in, in, if you were following in the prayer, the idea of the comfort that will, will be ours in heaven, just a world of perfect love and peace and joy the satisfaction that is there, the mercy that is ours throughout life and will be ours forever in heaven. And most of all, that blessing of seeing, the beatific vision or that blessed view of God, which basically to see is, is really to want nothing else. And you think about that, what are we going to be doing in heaven? Well, you've got this sight of God, which is so glorious that so beautiful that you don't want to take your eyes off it. Maybe we're just going to be spending eternity around the throne looking at God and being satisfied with that view. Well, these blessings are the things that Jesus earned through his spotless life and his death on the cross. These things belong to us, Jesus says, if the virtues that he has been speaking of, the virtues that are found in Jesus that really describe him, have been created in us by His Spirit, that is, we are becoming like the Lord Jesus. If we have a servant's heart, a grieving for sin, not just our own, but the sins of others, a gentle spirit, a yearning to do what's right, a longing for moral purity, a heart that is full of mercy and compassion, and a desire for peace. Again, not just uh, peace between one another, and not just our peace with God, but to be peacemakers, bringing others to faith in the Lord Jesus, or at least bringing the gospel to them so that the Lord may give them the grace to trust in Him, that there might be peace between the sinner and God. Now, if we see these things in ourselves, if we see them growing in us, and we're, as it were, growing in them, into Jesus' likeness and image, if we're becoming like Him to the point where we are drawing out more and more of the world's hatred against ourselves, Jesus says, then we are blessed. But Jesus doesn't stop there, of course, and this wasn't the end of the sermon. This was just basically an introduction to it. He goes on now to tell us that Christ-like character doesn't just bring persecution. It doesn't just bring the hatred of the world against us. It can also have a more positive effect. It can make us salt and light. Now, we, we know that it will harden some because it provokes sin. Christ's likeness, the light that shines from us of Christ's character, provokes the sin that is in unregenerate man's heart, that is the unbeliever. And again, I would remind you about how perfect Jesus was. Actually, he is. But when he was in this world, how perfectly he conducted himself. With such love, he showed the love of the Father to others and yet no one was hated as much as Jesus was hated. And Jesus reminds us that if they hated him, they're also going to hate us. If they hate the master of the household, how much more his servants. 
So this Christ-likeness will harden some, and the gospel will harden some, but it will also, by God's grace, be used by the Lord to move people in the right direction, to soften hearts and draw people to himself. Now, this is one reason, among others, that the Lord doesn't take us out of the world when he saves us. We are to be an influence for good, for the kingdom. He wants us to be salt and light. Now, this morning, we're going to look at what Jesus means when he says that we are the salt of the earth or the salt of the world. This evening, we're going to look at what it means to be uh, light. Now, first of all, Jesus says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. And again, I would just remind you, this is what you are in the Lord Jesus. It's not something you have to strive to become in the Lord Jesus, although there is a sense in which we do. We have to grow in it. But he's not talking about several things that must be true of us before we can enter into the kingdom of heaven that we have to do by our own strength. He's talking about what the Spirit of God works in us. But what does he mean by this? Well, as you probably know, salt has a variety of uses, and it had a variety of uses in the Jewish culture, as it also has in our culture today. And its most obvious use was as a seasoning for food. Job says in Job 6, verse 6, Can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Uh, they used salt in those days to season things. It gave flavor to things that were bland, and we certainly use it in the same way today. It helps to add flavor to our food. That's its more literal use. But it was also used in many different ways, and when it was, well, I should say it was used in symbolic ways, and it carried a symbolic meaning. It could be bad or it could be good, but there was a sort of an overarching uh, meaning behind the salt. Well, first of all, it was used as a sign of judgment. And one example of that we find in Scripture is when Abimelech, a Gideon's son, fought against Shechem. This is during the time of the judges. And he defeated it. And when he did, he destroyed the city. He leveled it to the ground. And then we read, he sowed the land with salt so that it would remain barren perpetually. We read in Numbers 9, verse 45, Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he captured the city and killed the people who were in it. Then he raised the city and sowed it with salt. Now, you've probably noticed if you've been driving along the coast or been somewhere near the ocean that plants have a hard time growing uh, around the ocean because of the salts. You know, if you look, uh, especially where the salt water comes in contact, you have nothing but a barren beach. Uh, and that's, again, because salt kills things, and it has a way of continuing to perpetuate that. Now, the same would be the case for Shechem. Once it was sown with salt, things wouldn't grow there any longer. So it was a symbolic of Shechem's becoming a perpetual ruin. Now, salt was also used in a positive way to cleanse and to disinfect. Uh, God, when on one occasion, when he was speaking of Jerusalem or the Jewish spiritual condition in a symbolic way, when he first found her and called her, when she was lost and without hope, mentions four things that should have been done for her, but weren't done for her. Uh, so we read in Ezekiel 16, verse 4, even though this is a negative example, it tells us something positive that should have been done. He says, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in cloths. And the idea here is that salt was also used as a disinfectant. The, the, if you rub the child with salt, it cut down on infections. Salt was something that the Lord told the Jews to add with their offerings, to include with all of their offerings. He says in Leviticus 2, verse 13, Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering, with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, the question would be, why salt it? Well, it was symbolic of God's faithfulness 
that he would keep, that he would preserve his covenant with his people. The Lord said to Aaron, the, the first high priest, the brother of Moses, on another occasion in Numbers 18, verse 19, he says, all the offerings of the holy gifts which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and to your descendants with you. Salt was symbolic of basically continuance or perpetuity. Salt symbolized preservation because it is a preservative. It has the ability to keep things from rotting, from decaying, because it kills bacteria. You probably noticed if you've ever had a piece of um, beef jerky or one of the many other types of jerky there are, that there was a lot of salt in it. Well, it was added during the process of preparing it, sort of like a slow cooking and drying process, to kill the bacteria that would otherwise grow in it and then kill the person who eats it. <laughs> so it preserves the, 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 the meat or the jerky during preparation and afterwards when it's stored until the time that it's eaten. So again, the idea of preservation, the idea of continuance. Well, it's in this sense that Jesus calls us salts. He says we are the salt of the earth. And I don't think he means that we add zest to the world. But I think what he means is that we have been sprinkled into the world so that the world might continue, so that it might be preserved from moral decay, for one thing, that would otherwise grow and obviously does grow around us when we're not exerting the influence of the gospel, and from judgment. Now, our presence preserves the world from moral decay because of what Jesus has made us because of his image in us, because he has put his love in our hearts by his Holy Spirit, because of the virtues listed in the Beatitudes and the virtuous actions that actually arise from these virtues, they all have the tendency to do virtually the same thing, to convict of sin, to restrain sin, and to turn people from sin in order to bring peace, and particularly peace with God. Now again, that's not to say that, that these, this Christ-likeness isn't going to have the opposite effect. We know it is going to have the opposite effect. Conviction can turn people to Jesus, but it can also turn people against Jesus and against us as we share that message with them. Jesus, again, had both effects on the people of his day. There were the days of his popularity when there were many people following him, amazed at the things he was doing, and glad to listen to him. His presence raised the standard of morality, at least in, in some, and moved those who were listening to him to seek after the kingdom of heaven. You know, John the Baptist had much the same effect when he went out into the wilderness to preach the, the message of repentance to get the people of Israel ready for the Messiah. His message convicted them. His message restrained them. His message got them moving in the right direction. However, he also offended people. Uh, he didn't offend them, but they were offended by the message, I should say. And they also hated him, and we know that he was killed. But, of course... Even though Jesus was popular for a while and there were a lot of people following him, there were many more ultimately who hated him, mainly among the Jewish leaders because his life and his message, as I pointed out with John's as well, continually exposed their hypocrisy and they did not like it. Now, as we become more like Jesus, we will be hated, we will be persecuted, but our Christ-likeness will also work to restrain the sins of those around us. It'll have the tendency to heighten their awareness of their own sins and through the Spirit's work on their conscience make them perhaps think twice before they choose to do the wrong thing. Now again, I don't know if you've, if you've been working with unbelievers and, and they come to know that you're a believer, but some, when that happens, oftentimes they begin to watch themselves around you, watching their P's and Q's as it were, being careful what they say, being careful about the jokes that they say, although when they get in a group, they might attack you, but at least one-on-one, -on -one, we seem to have that effect, and that effect comes from the Spirit of God working in us, exactly as Jesus said that it would.
Now, there's one other sense in which we are salt, and that is this, that our presence in this world preserves it from judgment. And I just want to say uh, just something briefly about that because I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind here. But it is true. The reason why the world continues to exist now after the fall is, is because of God's work in calling us out of the world. The reason why God simply didn't just do away with all of it when Adam and Eve rebelled against him was because he had a plan to redeem a people for his son. And the idea is simply this, the world continues because God is preserving it, because he has more people to call out of it. Everything he does to preserve the world, everything he does that he gives to the world in order to preserve us in the world is so that that work can continue. And it will continue until he has brought all of his sheep safely into his kingdom through his son. So we are also a preservative in that sense. As long as we are in the world, as long as there are more to be called out of the world, then God will preserve the world and he will continue to give good gifts to all men in order to preserve us in the world so they don't come after us. If we were the only ones that had the blessings, then what would the world do to us? They would come and take those blessings away from us. But God blesses them so that they won't come and take those things, so that, he, so that we can be preserved in the world. But again, Jesus here is primarily talking about the salt that he has made us to have a preserving influence morally in the world to stop the progress of sin and perhaps even to turn it around and move it in the right direction. But now Jesus goes on to say something that looks rather foreboding, and it is. That at first can be difficult to understand. And once it's understood, can be somewhat frightening because it is frightening for people who fall into this particular category. He says in the second part of uh, Matthew 5, verse 13, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, again, there are statements like this throughout Scripture. This is not the only one, but I think it's talking about a common theme that is in Scripture that we need to deal with. If salt loses its saltiness, its ability to do work, uh, to do its work, and I'm here talking about now literal salt, if it can no longer season food or preserve food, if it becomes ineffective, Jesus asks, how can you make the salt salty again? Well, the answer is you really can't. It's useless, and it ends up being thrown out. Now, this is something that I guess has been wrestled with for a long time, and I'm not saying that this is the definitive answer to this question, but we do need to realize this with regard to salt itself. Salt is a very stable chemical compound, sodium chloride. It's unlikely that anything in Palestine could have changed its ability to be salt. You know, they didn't have electrolysis back then. They couldn't change it from one thing to another. But it is true in those days that the salt that they had was not pure sodium chloride. As a matter of fact, it was a mixture of many different kinds of chemicals, one of which was the salt and the saltiness that they were after to season their food. But exposure to the rain could cause the sodium chloride to leach out of the other chemicals and to seep into the ground, leaving the crude salt useless. And when that happened, they just threw it out. It was no longer had any value. And as, as a matter of fact, it, uh, I think it was A.T. Robertson said it wasn't uncommon to see piles of salt lying around in Palestine and in Syria because it had lost its savor. It was no longer good for anything. So they just cast it out. Now, the big question is, what is Jesus talking about here with regard to people? Is he saying that it's possible for somebody to be salt, uh, to become a believer in, in, in that sense, to be salt, to become like Jesus Christ and to influence the world in the way that Jesus influenced the world, only to lose the saltiness, to lose salvation, to lose Christ's likeness, and to be thrown out of God's family. You know, that's how a lot of people actually, evangelical churches, interpret this. You can be a Christian, and then you cannot be a Christian and end up being destroyed forever. 
Well, whatever Jesus is talking about here, he cannot mean this if you believe what the rest of the Bible says because Jesus tells us he will never lose even one that the Father has given to him. I mean, listen to what he says in John 6, verses 39 through 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. This is an absolute statement, one of many in Scripture that indicates that if you are the Lord's, you cannot be lost. So if you were salt, if Jesus has made you to be salt, you cannot become unsalty. Well, now the question is, what does Jesus mean then? Well, he could mean one of two things, both of which kind of amount to the same thing. He could be talking about apostasy, and I believe he is talking about apostasy, about a person who professes to believe in the Lord Jesus, who believes they're trusting in the Lord, who is doing the right things, at least outwardly, and, and having some influence on the people of the world, who is received into the church and viewed by other believers to be a believer or to be salt, but a person who never really trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody who only appeared to trust in him. Now, these people are spoken of throughout Scripture. Again, this is not just the only place it appears. Jesus refers to them in John chapter 15 as the branches that are in him that do not bear fruit. And again, the fruit would be these beatitudes, these virtues that make us to be salt and light in the world. These branches seem to be connected to him, but they are not really connected to him. And again, same thing in Romans chapter 11. You have the olive tree with the natural branches and the, the uh, branches that are from wild olive trees that are grafted in and how the natural branches are broken off and how the other branches are grafted in. They stand by their faith, or they remain connected by their faith, but if they don't believe, they're gonna be broken off as well. How do we reconcile things like this with statements of Jesus, of this is the will of the Father, of all he has given me, I, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day? Well, again, it's this idea of apostasy. These branches are not bearing the fruit, they don't have these virtues. They're not uh, have, bearing the fruit that flows from those virtues. And so they will not inherit the blessings that are uh, connected to the virtues spoken of, the Beatitudes. They are not true believers, truly connected to Jesus Christ in a living and vital relationship. These are the ones that the Father, Jesus says, will eventually cut off of the vine. And again, when they're cut off, they're not cut off from union with the Lord Jesus Christ because by their lives they show that they never really knew him to begin with. But they're, they're cut off from their union with the visible church or that society of people who are the visible body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to see it in those terms because, again, of the statements we have of no true believer ever being lost. So listen to what Jesus says in John 15, verse 2, and then in verse 6. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that is the Father, takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. There's a sense in which one can be said to be in Jesus, but it's only by profession. It's only visibly and not really, and not be in true union with him. And then he says in verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And what, what are burned here are not the works that these people did, because there weren't any. There was no fruit. But it's the branches that appeared to be in Jesus that the Father pruned off because they weren't bearing fruit. They're cast into the fire, and the fire here is the fires of hell, because they did not know the Lord. John writes in 1 John 2.19, Speaking of the Antichrist here, the many Antichrists that had arisen during the time in which he was writing, and these were people who were false teachers, false prophets, they went out from us because they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. 
but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. There are people who profess faith in Jesus who really are not true believers, and this is what the warning is against. Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, again speaking about apostasy. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. You know that, that most um, ominous passage in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 6, is speaking about precisely the same thing. These authors are not speaking of believers who failed to persevere in exerting a preserving uh, effect on the world. They lost their saltiness and so were thrown away. If that were the case, that would make salvation to be by works. You know, Jesus saves you and you got to keep up a certain level of saltiness. Otherwise, if you get down to a certain level, he's going to throw you out. You would have to maintain your salvation basically by your works, and that's not what he's teaching us here. What they're speaking of are those who identify as believers, but ultimately who show they're not believers by losing their saltiness and by falling away. Now, that, that is true. That's what the Bible teaches. There are people like that. And let me just mention, you need, that's why we need to examine ourselves and why in many places in Scripture we're challenged to do this to make sure that we are genuine, make sure that we are true believers, that we really do love Him, that we really are becoming, uh, these, these virtues are being formed in us and we are becoming salt and light. If, if these things are not true, it doesn't matter what we say. We don't belong to Jesus. There will be transformation that takes place in our lives at some level, and it should be increasing as we continue on with him. So this is a warning I believe Jesus is giving against apostasy. But I think in another very, there's another very real possibility that Jesus actually had a narrower group in mind here, that he was speaking about the Jews in particular, that is the Jewish culture, because remember where we are in, in the history of, of redemption and God's dealing with, with the Jews. We're only uh, at the most 40 years away from 70 AD. Just about everything that Jesus says in this sermon is addressing and correcting the false teaching of the Jewish leaders. I mean, he's going to go on from here in verses 17 through 20 to talk about how our righteousness has to be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven. And of course, it will be if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're not and we're following the scribes and Pharisees, as Jesus goes on then to address their teaching versus what it really should be like, we see that Jesus came to give us his spirit so that our righteousness would be greater. But that's the spirit of God working in us. It's not something we do to kind of outshine or outstrip them. So Jesus talks about that in these verses. He goes on to address their instruction, their instruction of the law and how it was wrong in verses 21 through 48. At the beginning of chapter 6, he points out their hypocrisy in their giving alms, in their praying, in their fasting. And he says, this is what they do. Don't be like them. Now, the point behind this would be this. Israel had been called out by God from all the peoples of the earth to be the salt of the earth, the preserving agents of the earth, to be a light to the nations. But they had lost their saltiness. And it was only a matter of a few years, 70 AD, that the Lord, after he had called out his people, the gospel was preached to all the Jews. That's what the, the book of Acts is all about. They go to the Jews first, and they offer the Messiah to them because the promises were made to them. And then they go to the Gentiles, but by the time they're done, by the time the book of Acts is completed, just before 70 AD comes, the whole Roman Empire had been evangelized. All the Jews had heard the message. God had called out his people, and the next thing that happens is that the Lord is bringing judgment on them. God was going to cast them out, cast them out of the land, and he was going to destroy their temple, and they would be trodden underfoot by men. 
So Jesus very well may have had in mind here more specifically the apostasy of the Jews. And actually, we can take it a step further because, you know, we all wrestle with this idea of the unpardonable sin. Jesus may have had that in mind, the sin that has no forgiveness, the sin that so many of the Jewish leaders were actually guilty of because they, they knew who Jesus was. I hope you realize that. They saw Jesus doing what Messiah was supposed to do. They saw him teaching, doing miracles. And in the face of all of that, they reject him and say he's in league with the devil, even though they knew full well he could only be doing those things by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were committing, Jesus said, the unpardonable sin. They knew God's truth. They turned away from it because they wanted what they wanted for themselves. They wanted their position of honor. They didn't want Rome to come in and take it away from them, so Jesus has to go. That is hardening their hearts to the point where there was really, Jesus was saying, no hope for them. Now, this may well be why Jesus here said, using the illustration of salt again in Matthew 5.13, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That sounds fairly definitive, okay? The unpardonable sin means there's no forgiveness. That means there's, the Spirit of God isn't going to work anymore. That means God gives them over for judgment. That's, that's the end. So he may be referring to that because it sounds rather definitive here, just like it does in Hebrews chapter 6. But let me just remind us of one last thing here. He's not speaking about believers. Not, he's, he, nor is he talking about unbelievers who haven't heard the truth. But of those who know it, who know it very well, who have had this tremendous amount of light, if you read Hebrews 6, and yet they turn away from it, the author to the Hebrews says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance because they've rejected all that light and turned to Jesus. And we have to admit there are people who even are in the church, maybe as false professors, who turn away from it for a while, but the Lord brings them back. So I'm not saying that everybody who was in the church and falls away is ultimately... Uh, destroyed, but it is something that is possible, but this is something that is never possible for a true believer. They will never do this by God's grace because God's grace will hold us firm if we're trusting in Him. So Jesus' main point essentially is this, aside from the warning, He has given us His Holy Spirit to make us like Him so that we would have a preserving influence on the world. And that is what we need to be aiming our lives at. It's already true of us. If we're believers, you are the salt of the earth. All these things are true of you. But you know as well as I do, there's a lot of imperfection in our lives and we have a lot of growing to do. So we need to aim our lives at that and work at becoming saltier salt, which is a possibility for us as genuine believers. Now, this evening, we're going to consider that as believers, we are also uh, the light of the world. But let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to take uh, what we've heard, and we've heard a few things, and to examine our hearts and to apply it to us as, as we need to hear it.